We're taught from a young age that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. Later, we're told that wormholes are theoretically possible. There might be exceptions to this rule. Science fiction becomes far more entertaining, but when the movie is over, we're stuck with the old idea. Scholars throughout the ages have consistently denigrated any sudden or catastrophic change, whether they be in astronomy, geology, psychology, or other areas. The conservative and preferred view has generally been static or slowly changing systems. One of the most familiar themes we're left with is our view of evolution. The predominant interpretation of Darwin is a world emerging by transitions from non-living goo to life, from primitive one-celled organisms to a wide range of plants and animals. Life on Earth is the result of gradual and linear transformations branching in what we call biodiversity. Darwin's book pictures our multitude of species at the ends of a vast evolutionary tree. Two transitions are of particular interest. The first is that great leap from inanimate chemical soup to animate self-replicating entities. Most prevalent interest is in how humans of today developed from our primate ancestors. As human beings, we suffer from that hubris resulting from our ability to control our environment as opposed to our fellow creatures. We call ourselves the dominant species, and we are to an extent. It has been a long time since the Black Plague, but not so long since millions succumbed to yellow fever or cholera. Such tragedies were attributed to God rather than some lowly microbe or virus. Once the cause was known and methods to eradicate the bugs were found, we once again patted ourselves on the back. We still represent the process for the emergence of human beings as linear and progressive. In the Western tradition, if God had not granted everything at once for all time, then he must, like any architect, have had a straightforward plan. The current state of Homo or other species is thought to be at the pinnacle of development. This is a misinterpretation of Darwin's survival of the fittest concept. The traits of a species at any given point along that tree branch is the culmination of genetic traits most suited to the environment at that time. If that environment changes drastically, then the genome may no longer be viable. The evolutionary path of every species is riddled with chance or catastrophic events, which created a new branch along the way. Some biologists even today would say such events are rare. If we're thinking of the meteor strike that killed off the dinosaurs, they would be right. Even then, the Earth has seen at least five major extinction events. The case of the dinosaurs illustrates how an environment was drastically changed. There is a good idea of what happened in that fateful event. Immediately, there were massive tidal waves and burning lava, showering vast tracts of vegetation, setting it aflame. Years of darkness caused by the airborne soot would wreak havoc on other photosynthesizing plants and animals not in the direct path. Devastation by a meteor would be widespread, but not complete. Not every area of the planet suffered the same reduction in sunlight, nor were all animals wiped out. Microbes multiply so quickly that thousands of generations could mutate to adapt to a new world. The larger fauna at the top of the food chain soon starved, but smaller warm-blooded mammals could survive on seeds and other stored foods. Had the dinosaurs not met their end with the meteor, who is to say what direction evolution may have taken? Might intelligent beings arise from dinosaur stock, able to manipulate their environment, create fire, and leave the confines of Earth? Or perhaps no higher creatures would ever evolve, the term species is rather ill-defined, but one commonly used distinction is that those of a different species are not able to procreate, such that the offspring are also fertile. Where and how this happens is not exactly clear. One might think a lion and a tiger are different species, yet they are able to interbreed. Their offspring may also reproduce. Only recent advances in DNA analysis have begun to change our thinking on human evolution. 
Dennis Selvins, Neanderthals, and Homo sapiens sapiens have been classified as different species, yet mixtures of their DNA are still with us. Many of us have small amounts of Neanderthal or Denisovan DNA in modern genomes. The branches of Darwin's tree do not always remain separate. They may splice together for a time before diverging once more. The paths are no longer linear. Evolution of what we call simpler creatures may be highly nonlinear. New thinking on the habits of our earlier ancestors indicate a veritable orgy in the trade of genetic information. We tend to think of single-celled organisms dividing asexually or sexually, recombining to create offspring. This, however, is not the only way single-celled species are able to share genomes. Many can trade snippets of DNA through their membranes separate from the processes of procreation. These small segments, sometimes linear and sometimes circular, are called extrachromosomal elements, or ECEs. One recently discovered set of ECEs, classified as Borg, enable the metabolization of methane. Many wonder how the emergence of life on Earth came about so quickly. The answer may be in this frenzy of the exchange of DNA. Microbes produce countless generations very quickly as cells may divide in as little as 20 minutes. Relying on the random mutation of genes over several generations may not have been sufficient for such rapidity in evolution. The Soviet scientist Lysenko may not have been all wrong in this light. Very primitive forms likely traded, created, and threw out a multitude of DNA snippets within their own lifetimes. Such trading, which we can observe today under a microscope, has likely gone on since the beginning. This means that a microbe need not wait even a generation before determining if a new bit of DNA contributes to its survival. An interesting question might be what factors cause the microbe to keep or give up these ECEs. There must be something even at that level akin to the will to live or a way of sensing positive changes. No one could say that this energetic exchange of DNA is a picture of linear development. In light of Dr. Michael Levin's research and others, we need to ask how single cells form symbiotic collectives. What is it that made early cells band together, or was that also by chance? It makes sense that two cells with complementary capability might do better together. We could easily determine this from our elevated perspective. One example is a cell with no chloroplasts incorporating another capable of photosynthesis. Then there is one cell annexing another called a mitochondria with its own DNA to greater utilize available energy. At the cellular level, what is the driving force? How does each cell know what is best for them? Dr. Levin has shown images indicating the sending and receiving of electrical signals between cells. By changing the electrical potential across some cell membranes, he is able to manipulate specific pores of those cells, controlling what they absorb or expel. With drugs, these potentials may be controlled. In one experiment, he has rearranged the cells in a very early frog embryo, such as moving the precursors for eyes, mouth, and nose. In his words, he has created a frog or tadpole with a Picasso face. Over time, these cells exchange information and reform back into the face of a normal frog. The cells know what their final positions must be and shift back into place. As this occurs, the changing of various electrical potentials as they communicate may be observed. Dr. Levin calls this their cellular software. This communication takes place in the absence of any nerve cells. Another aspect of evolution may be described as a nonlinearity. This is sexual selection. A female peacock is said to choose a male according to the brightness or brilliance of his display. As we feel art is rather subjective, does she have a picture of that superior display imprinted in her DNA? If females choose males on the basis of survival prospects, then how does a large display of ungainly feathers contribute to a bird's chances. 
one would think that they'd be easier prey for predators. More surprising is a study of bioluminescent bacteria in the Atlantic Ocean. These creatures show a brilliant display of blue, which is actually a sort of vomit put out by the cell. This is done to attract the female. The interesting part is that within rather small areas where living conditions are essentially the same, there appear to be at least 100 different species of these animals. What distinction are the females making between such extremely similar displays? In a completely different area, we may also be a victim of linear thinking. This is in the field of cosmology. We're all familiar with the idea of the Big Bang, but what is the actual evidence for this? Before Edwin Hubble, the universe was assumed to be static, i.e. it always existed and the stars have essentially been constant. Hubble determined that the universe is actually flying apart at high velocities. This velocity is now in question. Additionally, velocities were determined by the redshift in the light emanating from some distant star or galaxy, a major factor which cosmologists ignore in favor of their gravity-dominated theories is that the universe consists largely of plasma, not electrically balanced matter. Plasma has many interesting properties. One is that light moving through a cloud of plasma will be redshifted. Another is that plasma will also refract light. The vast amounts of plasma out there interspersed with the bodies we're trying to measure may have their velocities calculated incorrectly due to exaggerated redshift. Another area of cosmology has to do with the life cycle of stars. I grew up with this very linear interpretation. The brightest stars live the shortest lives. The smaller red or brown dwarfs live many tens of billions of years. Stars larger than our sun continue to fuse nuclei into heavier and heavier elements until one day there is not enough energy to fight against gravitational collapse. The star then undergoes a massive implosion in a supernova. What's left is either nothing or a very dense star, like a white dwarf or neutron star. Recent observations have indicated stars may omit nova-like energies in multiple bursts. There's no mainstream theory accounting for several supernovae within the same star. The more platforms in orbit looking for supernovae, this new behavior has shown up many times. Again, cosmologists consider only gravity to be a factor in stellar evolution and discount the role of electricity. A star is a giant ball of plasma that is a mass of positive ions separated from electrons. New theories take the behavior of plasma into account. In Birkeland currents, for example, double layers form, which largely separate ions from electrons. Naturally, this creates a potential between the two layers, just as high voltages build up between storm clouds and the Earth. We're familiar with the vast amounts of energy released in electrical discharges during a lightning storm. Each bolt consists of millions of amperes of current. Extrapolate to a discharge between a star's photosphere and the surface. We can imagine how such large amounts of energy are detected and interpreted as supernovae. This is still conjecture, but must be considered. Quasars, which are possibly ejections from galaxies, will have their galactic boost misinterpreted due to additional redshift. Their positions may be interpreted as being much farther away than that of the galaxy which spawned it. This vastly changes our map of the cosmos. Linearity assumes all objects are being flung out at the same rate, and now that rate is said to be accelerating. What makes the Big Bang all the more curious is that it depends now on the highly speculative nonlinearity called expansion. According to theorists, space-time itself vastly expanded in the tiniest space of time and continues to do so. When one begins to look at accepted theories in several areas of physics, we find that many of these calculations have truly given up on cause and effect or true linearity. Instead, we get conjecture and fudge factors glossed over by a lot of flowery descriptions.